So today we're going to talk about a, a really interesting topic, and it's something that a, a lot of founders and um, entrepreneurs are thinking about all the time when they're when they're getting started, and that's allocating equity, allocating ownership among their founding team. You know, how do they do this? What type of things do they need to know? We're going to talk about the various stakes that someone could have in a business. Uh, we're going to talk about the different type of equity uh, that you usually see, and we're going to look at this in the context of of a corporation. We've been going back and forth about WeWash and, and UWash and UWash being an LLC because it's local and it's got tangible assets. But we're going to focus more on WeWash. It's a high growth, scalable company. So it's probably going to need to get some financing early on that it can't get through like traditional bank financing. So we're going to talk about how it's going to finance its business uh, later on, but we're going to focus on the things that it needs to have up front to be able to get to that point. And so we're going to talk about uh, the equity package, we're going to talk about common stock a little bit, preferred stock just for a second, um, and we're going to talk about stock options. We're going to talk about a concept called vesting, which takes care of a problem called freeloading. And we're going to talk at the end a little bit about who gets what, what percentage you should, should think about when you're when making these decisions. So the various stakes that uh, that someone could have in a business, right? We're going to talk about debt, we're going to talk about common stock, we're going to talk about preferred stock. Um, let's start with debt. So generally, debt is is a fixed number. So it's a principal that is loaned to a business uh, with interest, maybe at interest rate of you know three or five percent. And so let's think about if we're the person who's lending that money. We're going to want first priority. We're going to want our principal and interest to get returned to them before any of the owners start taking profits out of the business, right? So we're going to want a priority. We might want to think about getting a what's called a security interest, basically like a lien on some of the assets to be able to sell in order to make sure we get that money back. So we're thinking about tangible assets. We're thinking about ways that we can get the money we got back and the amount that we expect to get at a certain point in time when the debt is due. And so we have a lot of different, we don't really care about the upside in the business if, if we're a lender. We just, we just want our money back. We want to make safe bets. And so we're going to have fixed claims. We may have fixed claims on a particular asset, and we might have a fixed claim in a particular amount. And the way that we're going to be able to restrict or be able to watch over our investment is going to be much different than it would be with, a, with an owner of a business or an investor in a business. We're going to want to dictate these by contract by including in the loan documents things called covenants. They might be affirmative covenants. They might be what are, which are covenants that a company must do. They might be restrictive covenants, things that a company cannot do. And they might be tied to certain um, economic or financial metrics as well that a company is going to have to maintain. But again, we're talking about debt. We're talking about a fixed right. We're talking about safe bets. We're talking about priority. We're talking about on general restrictions. Let's go and look at common stock. Common stock, generally, if a company were to um, take on $100,000 in debt and they get that money and then they go and dissolve the company, they can't just take that $100,000 and give it to the stockholders. Why? Because the lender has priority. And so they are subordinate. Common stock is subordinate to debt. So basically what that means is that uh, maybe the company sells for a million dollars. Once it pays back its $100,000, that's when the company gets the remainder of that. It's a residual claim on the company's assets that is subordinate to the claims of creditors. So common stockholder has tremendous upside as we saw there, but they have limited downside protection, almost no downside protection. And one of the ways that common stock can, can work with their, um, their investment and make sure that they are able to appreciate the upside is that they have governance rights in the corporation. Notably, this is voting rights. So the stockholders can um, appoint and elect the board of directors, and those board of directors uh, go ahead and they appoint officers who then hire and fire employees. And then common stockholders will also have a little bit of, of other veto rights to certain major transactions in which they'll get a voting right. So as we can kind of see the relationship between debt and common stock, basically we're, we're seeing a situation in which common stock has the upside and debt has more of the assured or fixed claims. 
Let's look at preferred stock though. Preferred stock is gonna be a mix of common stock and debt. It's gonna look a lot like common stock, and then it's also gonna look like, a, like debt in a lot of ways. So notably, preferred stock is gonna have a, a preference over common stock. And so what that means is that generally they will include a liquidation preference. So if the company is, is sold or dissolved, they'll make sure that their, their investment is treated closer to debt than it is to equity. So they would be able to say, we want you know, our million dollars back first before you get any claim, which subordinates common stock even further. And when it comes to governance in preferred stock, we're basically looking at special rights. So they might not get the exact uh, type voting rights as common stock, but they might get very special voting rights. And so this might be designated board seats, or it might be the right to uh, veto certain transactions or certain things that occur. And we're gonna discuss preferred stock in other videos in much, much more detail. So let's go back to common stock. Let's think about our corporation. Let's think about WeWash. Let's think about some problems that we might have. So common stock. That's all the rights associated with ownership, okay? So common stock um, and restricted common stock is basically gonna have the equity position. It's gonna have the upside. You're gonna wanna issue common stock and more specifically restricted common stock when the stock value is low. We talked about par value and keeping par value low. We're gonna discuss a little bit further along exactly why Issuing stock when it's low is so important and some of the, the affirmative decisions and, and elections you'll need to make to in order to capitalize on this. Um, and when we're talking about paying for common stock, we are gonna need to pay par value. But how are we gonna pay for this? We're generally gonna pay for this in either cash or property, such as intellectual property, or a mix. So the founding team is gonna contribute something, cash or intellectual property rights, in exchange for this common stock. And so one thing that I, we see a lot is um, basically founders will come in and they're in different financial positions, right? So maybe a founder's already had an exit or has a little bit more of capital on hand to fund the business. And so they might want to contribute much more capital, but they want to also have a fixed split in ownership. Maybe they want to be 50-50. One of the founders is gonna contribute a lot of the intellectual property to a lot of the development. Other one wants to contribute cash. One of the best ways to deal with this um, without you know, having to issue way more shares of stock is to have one of the founders with, the, with more capital provide a loan. So they could either provide a loan to the company um, that isn't triggering any installment payments but might be paid out on certain events like raising a certain amount of money or selling the business. So it's gonna give them more of a, a debt stake to um, underscore the fact that they've given some cash. Often, and we're gonna talk about convertible notes, um, these loans will be in the form of convertible notes in which the loan will actually convert to equity at some point in the future. And convertible notes we'll discuss in, in other sections in much more detail. So uh, the thing with common stock is, is it's, it's best, and we'll see an example here in a bit, about why it's best to have restricted common stock. So restricted common stock is subject to vesting in a right of repurchase. And so let's just, just think about those terms and think about the terms vesting and right of repurchase. Well, we're gonna go and, and shift focus here to a different type of uh, equity stake that someone might have in a corporation, and that is through stock options. Stock options are not stock. They're merely the right to buy stock in the future at a set price. That set price is gonna be fair market value at the time the stock option is granted. That is called the strike price. That's the amount that the, that the recipient of the stock option is gonna to have to pay to buy the stock. So there's no stockholder rights until that strike price is paid and the option is exercised. Again, these stock options like restricted like restricted common stock are gonna be subject to a concept called vesting and forfeiture. Forfeiture is basically you can lose them if you do certain things. So let's switch over here to an example real quick and let's, let's think of uh, how stock options work in practice. So WeWash decides they wanna hire Carol and they don't have a ton of capital so they're gonna give her stock options. They're gonna give her 100,000 shares of, of stock and remember, they're gonna pull this out of their authorized shares and they're gonna set a strike price of 10 cents. 
Four years later, WeWash is exploding. It now has a stock value of $1 a share. So the stock is worth $100,000, 100,000 shares at $1 a share. But for Carol to receive the actual stock and exercise her option, she's only going to have to pay $10,000, the strike price, in order to receive stock worth $10,000. That's a pretty good deal for Carol, and it kind of shows one of the benefits of stock options, especially early on in issuing that to employees when the stock value is low. Let's look at another example. Adam and Betty are the founders of WeWash. They've each initially received 1 million shares of common stock. After six months, the business is going, but, you know, Betty receives a promotion at her day job, and, and she wants to focus on that instead of building WeWash. What happens? Does, do, does Betty get to keep her shares of stock? Does she get to continue to own 50% of the company? If she does, why in the world would Adam want to keep building this? He's likely going to have to bring somebody in to replace Betty, and he's not going to want to do that, and he's not going to want to carry on while being diluted and only being able to get 50% of the, the actual value later on. So he's going to be disincentivized. So what do we do? Well, we address this free rider problem with the concept of called vesting. So restricted stock is a su- stock that is subject to vesting. It usually vests over time and it's subject to a right of repurchase. So if a stock does not vest, and an individual that received the stock stops providing continuous service, like Betty, they they leave and they go pursue something else, then the company can buy that stock back at the price that it was worth when it was issued, that relatively low price. And so let's, let's think back to the very beginning when we talked about granting stock when it's low, early on in the process. Now, if you have a right of repurchase, the company's not going to have to spend a ton of money to go ahead and buy that stock back. Also, we're talking about vesting. Often vesting is tied to time. So that's usually the standard there is a four-year vesting period with what's called a one-year cliff. What that means is that the stock, so let's say Betty's stock of 1 million shares of stock, if she had restricted stock, instead of common stock, had actually been, uh, her 1 million shares had been tied to a four-year vesting schedule with a one-year cliff, her 1 million shares would vest over four years. The one-year cliff means that she only receives any of those shares, uh, those only, only some of those shares are released from the right of repurchase once she's been there for one year. So if she left within six months, she's not going to get to keep Uh, any of her shares. The company will have a right to repurchase all of her shares back at the price that it was issued. And this protects the company. Once she gets past the one-year period, it will vest over time. It could be yearly. It could be quarterly. It could be daily or monthly. Usually, the remainder of the time is, is subject to monthly vesting. So let's, let's take another example and let's look at vesting in another context. So let's say after two years, we wash sells for $100 million. We have Adam and Betty that are still in place. They each own uh, 1 million shares of stock. But we wash along the way had a small investment round that gave the investors 20% of, of the company. We're two years in. We had a four-year vesting schedule at the one-year cliff. So Adam and Betty's stock is, is only 50% vested. What happens? They just sold for $100 million. Do they only get half of that value? This is a concept called acceleration. Often restricted stock purchase agreements, which are used to to distribute equity, restricted stock to the founding team, includes a concept called acceleration, and which is in the flavor of single trigger acceleration and double trigger acceleration. Single trigger acceleration basically says, if the company sells, we will accelerate your vesting immediately prior to the sale so that way you can get your percentage of the proceeds. Double trigger is a little bit more investor friendly. So it requires two events. The two events are the company has to sell and then also the founders need to be terminated by the acquirer within a certain period of time or upon certain conditions after the sale occurs. Buyers will want double trigger and investors will want double trigger because they'll want to have the founders carry on that business. Usually when a business is acquired, there's going to need to be a little bit of onboarding and transition period of time. And if the founders just leave 
and they have the full rights to vesting, then they're not going to be able to help that onboarding or transition period at all. And so the buyer, it's, it's maybe a little bit less valuable. So you might see this accounted for in the purchase price as well. Let's back up. Let's go back to restricted stock. And I mentioned earlier that restricted stock is, is usually granted at par value or a very, very low price because at the time that's given to the founding team, it's so early in the process that the company is essentially without value. And we're not talking about speculative value, we're talking about actual value. So one of the most important things when it comes to restricted stock is what's called an 83B election which must be filed with the IRS within 30 days of the issuance of restricted stock. Basically, it's a decision that a founder makes to be taxed on the full value of the stock at the time it's issued. Without that 83B election, the founder or the recipient is gonna be taxed as the stock vests. But when we're talking about WeWash, we're talking about a company that's going to grow exponentially. The value of the stock is gonna go up crazy. It's gonna go up a lot over time. And so we don't want to be taxed at vesting. It's going to be more expensive then. We want to be taxed early on when the stock value is essentially nothing, when it's par value or super low. So this is obviously advantageous to file an 83B election when your company is anticipated to be very scalable and to grow really quickly. Let's take a look at an example of how vesting and how an 83B election works. So Again, Admin Betty are two founders of WeWash. They're issued 1 million shares at par value, which is a quarter of a penny. Uh, one year later, the stock value increases to a dollar a share. That's great. After one year, 25% of the stock is vested. So if Adam and Betty filed an 83B election within 30 days of the issuance, then the tax, they would be taxed on the value at the time it was issued which was a fraction of a penny of 1 million shares, so $100. If an 83B election wasn't filed and one year has passed and that one year cliff is, is hurdled, then they would be entitled to 25% of the stock of 1 million shares at a price of $1. The taxable value is $250,000. That's drastically different. So that just underscores how important it is to file an 83B election and how it's a paramount aspect of restricted stock. So all this talk about restricted stock, stock options, preferred stock, who gets what? How do you decide who gets what? Well, generally, restricted stock has that mechanism of the 83B election and being able to give this out and being able to choose uh, to be taxed on the value at the time of issuance. So that's the most appropriate mechanism for founding teams, okay? So you might have the founders, uh, the, the initial owners like Adam and Betty. You might have an early employee that is uh, paramount to the success, success of a business. So maybe it's a, a technical uh, employee that's going to be developing the code in WeWash or something like that. That restricted stock is going to have voting rights. Let's go and look at stock options. Stock options are going to be available for any service providers. These could be employees, these could be contractors, these could be board advisors, consultants, really anyone. And so it's obviously gonna be important to keep, to issue these stock options when the price is low as well. But these individuals are not gonna be getting voting rights. So you're probably not gonna, you're gonna wanna keep them at a little bit arm's length and maybe not have as much a say in the election of the board and other uh, stockholder voting matters. Preferred stock. These are gonna to go to investors. Again, we're gonna talk about this in its own section or a couple of sections about preferred stock and the relationship of investors and what to know about investors and how that, that all works. Uh, those, those rights are gonna be special voting rights. And again, we're gonna discuss that in much more detail. If you talk generally about the lifeblood of a company that, that raises preferred stock and eventually exits, what you're gonna see is the founding team, depending on the valuation in which they raise the stock and the valuation at the time they exit, is generally gonna be probably between 30 and 60%. And that's just, that's just general, every situation's different. The stock option pool, which we'll learn about later, uh, for employees and service providers will generally be around 10 to 20%. And the preferred stock ownership or the investment ownership will generally be about you know 20 to 50%. It could be lower, it could be higher. So that's kind of a little bit of an overview about allocating equity among a founding team. Uh, until next time, venture awaits.